right, it's 11 o'clock, so I think we are going to get going. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, my name is Danielle, and thank you for joining myself uh, today in conjunction with Conveyancing uh, Data Services, uh, looking at our mining legacy. So as always, a bit of housekeeping before I get going. Um, we will be recording the session and there'll be a copy of the slides made available after the webinar. So please do let us know if you'd like a copy of those afterwards and we can send that out to you. You should see a control panel uh, on your screen, which allows you to ask, uh, submit written questions. So please feel free to submit those as we go along and I'll try and get them answered during or after the webinar. Um, for any of the attendees that are staying for the full session today, uh, you will also be automatically entered into a contest that is running every month until the end of the year, which allows you to, uh, for a chance to win some Apple goodies. So yeah, if you'd like any more details on that, do let us know. Uh, and one final thing is, sorry if I sound like I'm a bit full of cotton wool. <laughs> Um, I have the dreaded seasonal cold that is going around, so apologies um, if I'm a little bit fuzzy sounding, but hopefully you can hear me clearly. So let's get started. This is what we're going to be looking at today. Um, we're really going to start with the basics of, of mining and looking at the different types of mining uh, in the country, looking at the data and, and some interesting case studies that we've got along with finishing up with what is, uh, what, what's in our reports and what we cover. So let's take a look at mining in a very general sense. Um, I think we all have a fairly good idea of what mining is about. So mining is the extraction of minerals or geological deposits from the earth. Consider something almost everybody owns, let's say a smartphone. It, it, it's gonna contain an abundance of of a lot of the minerals that we've listed on the screen for you. So, you know, it is an everyday, uh, we use all these materials every single day, which is why mining is, is such a key uh, important activity that we do. Now, when we, took a, we look at the life cycle of mining and the full circle of it, it's actually quite interesting. You know, consider simply the demands for mining by the mining industry itself. So, we need coal for power to produce steel. So there's a demand for coal to power the foundries that produce steel that we use in everyday things. Now steel is required to make tools in order to mine the coal and for the headgear to raise the coal to the surface. Uh, coal is needed to power pumping engines and steam locomotives, allowing miners to go deeper in both coal and metal mines. Um, we look at, you know, following that on, looking at things like bricks. Bricks are also needed to build the mine buildings and the foundries themselves. Other important minerals like clay, shale, limestone, chalk are all mined in brick fields. You've got things like crucibles, which are needed to smelt steel, and these are made from fire clay, often found interbedded between coal seams. And the cycle goes on and on and around and around. And Although mining seems an old archaic activity, I think we all kind of had this really, um, you know, the stuff that you learn in school, it is very, very much still present today and has evolved with more sophisticated tools and methods to extract what our lifestyles demand of this earth. So, you know, it's just, I think it's good to kind of reset and think about mining, not just in the old terms, but what it actually means now. Um, so yeah, so I just thought it was a really, really interesting thing to point out. So let's take a quick look at the different types of mining. I'm not going to go into too much detail for all of these different kinds, but we'll have a look at sort of some of the more common ones. So here you can see different types of mining and mining methods. Um, an early method of coal extraction is drift mining. So where coal deposits became exposed within a hillside or a valley, these would be extracted by hand into the hillside until the coal was depleted. Uh, the working became unstable and collapses and collapse or the mine became unworkable due to being flooded. Um, another type of mining would be something like bell pit mining. So this is a really early form of coal mining uh, that works deposits found close to the surface. Uh, these may have been in the order of 50 meters, 15 meters deep 
restricted to the primitive techniques available to the miners in terms of controlling the stability of the feature and risk of inundation. So this involves the sinking of a narrow shaft to access the deposit before working the coal out by hand, leaving a bell-shaped excavation beneath the surface, hence the name bell pit mining. Um, the coal was then winched to the surface via a bucket, much like, uh, much, very much like well, a well. And these are highly unstable workings. So as a pit became unstable, the miners would return to the surface, sink another shaft ages into the previous one in, hope, in a hope to come down on the coal seam again. So examples of this type of mining can be found in places like Yorkshire and the Forest of Dean. These workings lie largely unrecorded, except on old paper geological mapping and aerial imagery and LIDAR. In, in these instances, clusters of these shafts uh, can be identified. Um, you've also got things like long wall mining. Long wall mining is a form of underground coal mining where a long wall of coal is mined in a single slice. Uh, large rectangular blocks of coal are defined during the development stage of the mine and are then extracted in a single, single continuous operation. And this type of mining became popular in the in Industrial Revolution, where there became a huge demand for steam-powered engines and national industrialization. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, th that's just a few different kinds, uh, you know, of, of mining that we have all over the country. And again, depending on the minerals, uh, you have to kind of take into consideration that actually all there could be all manner of different types of minerals, uh, let's say embedded within a coal seam. So it's not just coal mining that will happen at one time. It could be multiple types of mining happening um, at the same time. Um, so let's take a closer look. So in terms of coal mining, uh, the UK has, a, of course, a fairly hot, long history with the earliest evidence, evidence of coal extraction dating back to the Neolithic time, some 12,000 years ago. Techniques like bell pit mining would have been used. The majority of these pits lie uh, unrecorded, as I mentioned previously. Um, you know, here you see this group of miners was, wait, wait, was waiting patiently to go up to the surface in the pits of um, a Welsh coal field near Cardiff in 1910. Um, and really 1913 was roughly about the peak coal production time. For decades, coal mining in the UK was the backbone of the economy in stimulated regions, including the north of England, the Midlands, Wales, and Scotland, by employing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and then of course you had in the minor strikes in the 1970s, and the 1970s onwards saw mass closures of the collieries that began to cripple the industry. Um, the, the miner strike of 1984-85 was a major industrial action to shut down the British coal industry in an attempt to prevent colliery closures. And in this image here, that's the last day of the Kell Kellingley Colliery. So that's Britain's last deep coal mine, which is in North Yorkshire, which closed actually in December of 2015. Now, whilst... Uh, there are currently no deep coal mines active in the UK. We actually still use open cast mines to mine for coal. Uh, there are currently 13 active open cast coal mines in the UK. Um, and of course, you have to think about the legacy that uh, coal mines are going to leave behind. And one of the most controversial topics um, within the UK climate change discussion is, of course, the coal, uh, a, a potentially new coal mine in West Cumbria. So there's been a lot of back and forth about this. Is it happening? Is it not? Um, back in February of 2020, Boris Johnson had announced the deadline for phasing out unbated coal generation um, and would be, you know, that would start happening from 2024. Uh, there's been further talks about this in on COP26. Uh, so again, we're still kind of looking at all of these different um, decisions as to whether or not we're going to continue with the coal, uh, coal mining or not in this country. It's certainly one that is going to, I think, keep coming back, um, particularly when we start looking at things like CO2 emissions. Um, so again, one to keep an eye on and one that's going to have a long lasting uh, legacy with us. 
And what other types of mining are there? So you've got limestone mining in the East Midlands. So here is an example of limestone mine shafts uh, in the East Midlands. You've got outcrops of limestone that are recorded throughout the East Midlands. Um, places like Nottingham, you know, some people might not realize, but it's home to some extensive uh, dolomite limestone deposits. Um, in Middleton, the Middleton mine in Derbyshire is famous for producing limestone for Commonwealth war graves. Um, originating as a quarry, the mine was extended to include nearly 25 miles of subsurface tunneling and worked via a pillar and stall method with pillars of over 15 meters square. So, you know, it's again, I think a lot of people tend to think of coal mines, but actually there's a lot of different kinds of mining that happen all over here. And like you can see in that photo, some pretty significant amount of limestone mining that actually occurs in the East Midlands. Um, we, of course, you know, bringing it a, a bit closer to London, we've got a load of chalk mines um, down south, often found at the periphery of the London Basin. You know, chalk here around the London area is at its shallowest. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't a huge amount of recorded plans. They do exist, they're quite old, they're quite inaccurate. And, and the image that you see is, is Brick Lane Cottages in Plumstead. So the diamonds on the left-hand side of that map image is the point of an initial collapse that happened in 2016. And the stars uh, that you see on the screen on the right-hand side are other recorded settlements and subsidence claims. The red dots on the map are, are shafts, and then the purple is the actual network of underground chalk mines. Now, the London Basin is a geological feature made up of a wide variety of different rock types, but split into three main formation or groups. The top layer is London clay, and these clays overlie the Lambeth group, which sits above the rich deposits of chalk, a form of calcite-rich limestone. And as part of London's expansion, the demand for lime mortar and bricks basically grew. And mines to extract the chalk, clay, limestone became a lot more common and were often associated with early brickworks. Little to no legalities when it came to recording a mine upon its ab abandonment. And again, so, you know, there is a question about how accurate um, these mine abandonment plans are. Um, you know, coal is coal certainly has a is a bit better. Uh, but there are other types of mining. Now, Plumstead is located towards the edge of the basin, and therefore the depth to chalk uh, is significantly reduced. Now, in 2016, I mentioned earlier, there was a collapse recorded outside a newly constructed property at Brickfield Cottages, and neighboring properties within the development were actually evacuated. And with a history of extensive mining, a great deal of thought and consideration should have been given to the potential risk. Now, the properties themselves were constructed upon an area formerly used for brick production, and brick fields were very common in the 18th and 19th century. Typically, any topsoil top or overburden was actually removed by hand. Clays were then extracted and were commonly mixed with chalk to form bricks. And as far back as 1865, uh, the Ordnance Survey records brickworks in the general area of the cottages, that you see on the screen, not surprising given the name Brickfield Cottages. Um, 18, in 1894, the Ordnance Survey clearly shows signs of quarrying directly upon what would later become that development area. And in the 1986 edition, the extraction of expa has expanded east towards the area that will become known for its large underground chalk mine. So this mine lies less than 100 meters east of the development area and has been responsible for a number of settlement and subsidence events taking place. So it includes a network of tunnels and galleries, as well as a number of shafts sunk down through the overburden into the chalk below. So a really, really good example, I, you know, certainly if you live in and around London or if you do any transactions in and around London, I would say people are probably less aware of, of actual mining that happens in and around London, but it does occur um, as demonstrated by this. And so it is well worth making sure that you're aware of what is happening from a mining perspective activity, uh, not just in the, the kind of the more common sense areas of the Southwest or the Northeast, um, but also in areas like London. Now on the screen, you're, you'll see a table of materials which have been mined uh, throughout the country. So there's 60 different minerals 
um, and they fall into five different categories. Uh, to ensure that we have a full accurate picture of mining risk, we of course cover all of these, making sure that we're not leaving any gaps. So you've got metals uh, or metalliferous, uh, traditionally thought to be confined to the Southwest. So if you live in the Southwest, you know, you've got tin, copper, those tend to be the ones that people tend to think of. Um, they were also actually extensively mined in regions like the Peak District, North Wales, Somerset, and Cumbria. Then you've got stone mining. So this includes things like clay or China ball clay, as some of you may know in certain areas of the Southwest. Historically, this represents the most extensive exploitation of mineral resources in the country. This also includes things like limestone, bathstone, uh, and chalk. And, and as of course, some of this activity and this type of mining activity does continue today. You've then got evaporites. So the most commonly known evaporites are brine and gypsum. So if you happen to be in the Cheshire area, there's a lot of brine there. And brine has been extracted as a solution um, from several areas in England, including Cheshire, Staffordshire, Lanc Lancashire, um, but not typical in the Southwest. So this category also includes things like rock salt, alabaster, uh, potash. So you may hear customers asking you for searches that cover those types of minerals. You, of course, have coal mining and under coal mining, you have things like Biddeford Black. So if you're in the southwest, again, that's a very specific type of coal in that area. Um, and we're looking at more than 11,000 square miles of, of coal mining in England and Wales. There are over 170,000 coal mine entries known in the country. Uh, however, only one in three are recorded with mine plans and maps. So there are many more out there um, that we may not necessarily be aware of. And then finally, you've got hydrocarbons. So this is to do with the extracting of oil and gas. I'm sure there's been a lot of talk about gas extraction and where we're getting our gases from. And this dates back to around the 17th century, uh, common in areas like Dorset. Although it wasn't really until the 1800s when oil and gas was extracted commercially and used to light the streets. However, since then, around 2,200 oil and gas wells have since been drilled onshore. And then, of course, you've got the offshore drilling as well. So all of these are we take into consideration to make sure that you've got a complete uh, picture. Some of you may have seen this image before, but when we're talking about mining risk, it is really important to not just think about coal, but also everything else that I've just discussed. So on this image on the screen, you've got the various types of mining risks. So that gray splodge that you see on the screen is the Cheshire Brine Compensation District, which you can see it's a fairly small area in comparison to the rest of the country. That mustard yellow that's come onto the screen, well, that's the coal field, uh, which as I've mentioned earlier, covers more than 11,000 square miles of England and Wales. And then finally, when we're talking about all other types of mining or what we call non-coal, that's the green area that's come up on the screen. So it's been estimated that around 56% of properties are potentially affected by other mining and ground stability issues. However, that doesn't mean that a report is going to be needed every single time. Of course not. Um, from the analysis of our data, which we've really try to make sure that it's refined so that we are only identifying a risk where there truly is one. Uh, our, our analysis indicates that 22% of properties in England, Wales, and Scotland will need a non-coal report. Uh, if you take into account non-coal as well as coal, then it would be 39% of properties. And if, if you happen to be the unfortunate person that also lives near the Cheshire Brine area and uh, you have all three risks apply to you, then it's just for, it, then it's 40% of, of properties. Um, and really, as I've mentioned before, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, when it comes to non-coal issues, the, the liability falls to the homeowner. Whereas with Cheshire Brine and with coal, you of course have the coal, bo coal board and the Cheshire Brine board or the coal authority and the Cheshire Brine board that you can go to to make things right with non-coal if it happens to be that it's a non-coal type mining that has caused ground subsidence issues there is no recourse for claiming as you would with coal and brine so just something to to bear that in mind now let's take a look at you know data and where the data sources for mining comes from so 
Prior to the 19th century, coal mining, of course, remained largely unrecorded. In 1840, the first MRO was established in London. It wasn't actually until 1872 that the Coal Mines Regulation Act came into action, making it a legal requirement to deposit an abandonment plan within three months from the date of abandonment. Now, it was a requirement to produce a plan from 1850, but no requirement to deposit. So the key point to note here was that all that was required to be shown on the on these plans was the boundary of the mine working up to the time of abandonment. There wasn't there was no requirement for orientation uh, with the surface depth or section information to be shown. And abandonment abandonment plans were used to help ensure the safety of the miners. Uh, around 1883, the MRO was transferred to the Home Office, no doubt uh, along with a collection of the plans. In 1923 to 1931, there were two mining accidents following which there was a call for plans to be deposited and which was widely responded to. So this was significant as it now included plans which identified the underground workings. And then in 1939, all of the plans were transferred to Buxton from London. So after the Second World War in 1950, coal plans were segregated from plans of other minerals and split into regional areas to allow plans to be more easily accessible. And the collection of coal plans were reunited in 1992 to British coal site near Burton-on-Trent and were then inherited by what you now know as the Coal Authority uh, on privatization of the coal industry in 1994 uh, to be finally transferred to the Coal Authority headquarters in Mansfield. Now, the reason why I've, like, we wanted to go through this little swift history of plans is really plans is to demonstrate that plans were something never produced, not deposited. Um, in some cases, they were lost in transit. Some cases, they were unreadable. Um, there's all sorts of things that have happened to them. And so this really tells us that records we consider are incomplete. And the reasons why the plans were produced is not necessarily clear on the plans deposited. So as an example, plans can show exaggerated reserves drawn to raise interest in selling shares. The plans may only show a fraction of the mine's extent, identifying only those areas which the mine was looking to exploit. So all this provides the reason that you should have, have a really experienced, competent coal mining assessment undertaken. And of course, it is integral to the rationale in the provision of the CON 29M that we see today. So you know, we really try and look at not just the Coal Authority's data, but the we draw on the experience from uh, the miners and the geologists who do this stuff, you know, day in, day out and go on site. Um, in terms of mine entries and, and recorded workings, so it's good to understand because you'll see terms like shafts and adits uh, within a report. A shaft is a vertical excavation or a near vertical excavation onto a mineral deposit or ore body. Um, 135,000 recorded coal shafts. You know, it's a pretty big number. And at it, on the other hand, is a horizontal tunnel which features, uh, which is basically used to, uh, used for drainage, haulage, access, water removal. So again, 38,000 recorded coal audits. Uh, it's pretty significant. And here you see an image of some recorded working. So that's this information that you see on the screen now is what would go into your report. And you can see on the on the map and you've got the, the legend on the map, you know, recorded workings in the UK cover over 20,000 square kilometers. <laughs> and as uh, my colleague has put, the same as two million rugby pitches, if you can even visualize that in your head, it's a pretty significant number. So it's a significant amount of, of information that we need to go through. Now, the National Mining and Stability Model, stay that 10 times, um, is a tool that we actually use and developed. Uh, and we've used it for many years within mining and, and ground stability reports. So the model has been developed and refined over the last 40 years of reporting and investigating mining related risks. So the model now includes even more proprietary and third party data to make sure that we're, we've got a comprehensive assessment and a comprehensive assessment is provided for each individual property that you're searching against. And each mining feature and data point has been expertly risk ranked. This combined with 
our, you know, our expert knowledge in terms of geology and mining risk, investigation reports, additional information from thousands of transactions really allows us to accurately assess the mining and stability risk posed to each individual property. So when each report is ordered, which may be off the back of one of our uh, alerts, it basically goes through the national mining and stability model to determine the risk to a property. And where risks are identified, a specialist mining consultant will review all of the data available in relation to the property you're searching against and the surrounding area to determine if there is an actual risk. Now, in many instances, we will be able to issue a past report. Whilst some may not see the importance of a mining search if it has passed, you at least have the peace of mind that the report has been fully interpreted, which is where the value lies in knowing that your client's property isn't going to be affected. Um, in terms of our, you know, the experience our mining consultants have, when we look collectively, when Groundshare and Mining Searches UK uh, merged in January 2020, um, we really joined forces and we've had uh, a lot of experience uh, taken in-house. And some people have been investigating and securing, securing mining risks since 1978. We've got a huge collection of mine plans in addition to the additional data that we have when it comes to historic mining, as well as our historic mapping. Um, and through that, we're building a whole bunch of innovative, different solutions, depending on what clients need, things like 3D, 3D modeling. We do work with uh, developers and such um, to, to try and make sure that whatever they're doing is uh, as risk-free as possible. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting, uh, you know, the, the team have some pretty fascinating and amazing pieces of experience. Um, they've been out to sites hundreds of thousands of times, and that experience is all collected in-house. Now, the map on the screen that you can see is actually a map of Liberton uh, Mine in Yorkshire, and this is an ironstone uh, mine. They were originally all paper maps, but our team have digitized them, which is really great, and it helps with that assessment. So let's take a look at some uh, real-life examples here. Um, some more recent than others. So this is based in Manchester. So in 2020, uh, Manchester, of course, was home to half a million people. Um, a function of the boom of the city has, has experienced since the Industrial Revolution. It boasts the UK's first working canal, the first inner city railway, and became one of the largest producers of cotton. But Manchester has a lesser known but significant uh, route in mining and minerals. The Ardwick limestone mines were a complex enterprise of quarrying and subsurface extraction that lies beneath today's densely populated city. Um, limestone in itself is a very highly porous uh, material, uh, joint, joint rock that is more likely to dissolve with increased water being charged through the soil and especially around mine working openings and shafts where it can travel more freely. Now, when you think about climate change, the potential for greater dissolution, which is basically the dissolving of that rock, could expose more shafts in densely populated parts of the city as rainfall increases year on year. And we all know that that has definitely happened um, in the last you know, 10, 20 years. We've had more extreme rain events. We've had more rain. Um, and it's just um, one of the risks that comes with it. Now, our senior search writer, writer, Ben Oldcorn, has spent a lot of time digitizing and interpreting the historical data relating to the mines at Ardwick. And he basically said, when one thinks of limestone mining in an urban area, Walsall is probably the most famous case. However, Ardwick deserves serious attention given the degree of development and population now living around and above the workings. So really, really interesting. Um, in 1848, the Ordnance Survey uh, record, uh, records the Ardwick Lime Works just east of Medlock River, situated over an outcrop of limestone, and its aim was to exploit this large natural deposit as a source of lime mortar for the construction of multiple aqueducts all over the city. 
The earlier plans record a number of large brick fields, but fail to record in detail the extent of any associated workings. And later, towards the end of the 1800s, there were signs of extraction at the surface, including large clay pits and a number of shafts being sunk as part of Ardrick's expansion, which at its peak encompassed approximately 200,000 square meters of subterranean mines. Now, it was not the job of the Ordnance Survey to report on underground operations. This was actually down to the mine owners, who, upon abandonment, were legally required to produce and formally deposit a plan of the mine workings to the mine, Mining Records Office. The plan was produced in 1899 and shows in detail the extent of the limestone removed, as well as the number of shafts sunk down onto the deposit, along with portals or access points driven horizontally into the mine. Now, whilst the records of the later workings at Ardwick are relatively complete, there is evidence of tools dating back to the Roman occupation. These are revealed by primitive tool markings typical of this period. Also, limestone that was identified specific to the mines of Ardwick has been found at Roman sites throughout the city. And it highlights that even if there is a seemingly comprehensive history of the site, there's always the risk of, of workings dating back even before records began. Now, we are able to provide detail, re detailed research into the history of, of a region itself in order to deliver the best insight for you and your clients to verify the degree of risk. And our consultants look for telltale signs of primitive mining uh, whilst analyzing more contemporary sources to, cal to calculate things like a unique zone of influence. Uh, for the 19th century expansion of the mine. And given the potential for increased erosion of subsurface limestone mine operations uh, with future, with, you know, with the consideration of future climate change and higher rainfall, it's really, really important to accurately identify these in relation to property. So equally, we can put hopefully your, your minds as well as your clients' minds at risk, rest to ensure that transactions are able to continue smoothly. So, you know, even though this happened a very, very long time ago, it does have impact uh, particularly if you are in uh, an old mining area. Here's another example in Bristol. So the Radcliffe Caves may slip under the radar for those considering potential risk from historic mining legacy. So the caves lie directly beneath a densely populated residential area with a mix of Georgian, Victorian and modern houses together with some commercial properties, uh, including a large hotel. Therefore, understanding their impact at property level and how future climate change may affect the character of the red sandstone below them is quite important. Now, historic ordnance survey mapping provides little to no insight into the cave's existence, leaving the location and extent of the workings to be clarified through detailed research from our mining consultancy team. Known locally as the Redcliffe Caves, these Cavernous subterranean features are actually prime examples of underground quarrying. Situated to the west of St. Mary Redcliffe Church, they are a complex network of tunnels and galleries dug to explore, exploit the local sandstone. Uh, you've then got the red ochre sandstone, which was used heavily in local glass and pottery production. Now, when you ground that into a fine sand, it makes for a cost-effective solution for dark green glass whilst it's also used for a variety of different glazes with ceramics. So the caves are actually still owned by a local glassworks today, but their discovery and subsequent e exploration has a limited history. And there are various conflicting references throughout, throughout history from like circa 1186, right up until 1868, that paint a picture of the quarries and their possible uses. In the mid 1700s, Documentary evidence suggests Spanish and French prisoners were held captive there. Thereafter, they were used as a storage facility for the glassworks, who then operated the mines. And in 1868, the tunnels were broken into by rail workers excavating a rail tunnel spanning the extent of the workings. There's a bunch of myth and legend that surrounds these quarries, and one relates to potential smuggling due perhaps to the proximity to the water. Whilst there's no evidence to support the theory, one can imagine illegal contraband being taken from ships docked in the harbor um, and scuttled away in the caves below. 
The one thing we do know for sure is that these caves are most certainly man-made and they're not naturally occurring. Archaeological investigation has observed pick marks on the walls and ceilings, whilst geological exploration identifies an absence of comparable naturally occurring sandstone caves in the area. So the, the demand from local industry is for this rich red ochre, red sandstone, uh, red sandstone heavily points to them being quarries. Now, when assessing historic mining activity, it's really important to have, again, a, a good understanding of mineral extraction in any given area. Uh, a superior level of in-depth research is really warranted to obtain a full appreciation of what lies beneath the surface of a property. And using in-house historic land use data alongside the historic ordnance survey mapping, paper geological map plans, detailed surveys of the caves themselves, we are able to hone in on the true risk of these features. Um, again, our mining consultancy team conducted have conducted their own research into these mines and backed up by cartographic and additional documentary evidence so we can gain a really clear understanding of what's going on below and report those risks to you and your client. You know, and really, in summary, the more data and more research and more understanding that we have, it allows us to confidently pass a higher percentage of properties in the area uh, than ever before, which is why it's a continuous um, process, you know, collecting all this information and all this data. Um, another example, I think this one's a pretty famous one. So here you've got the Gosforth mine shaft collapse. Uh, the Coal Authority's emergency response team attended the site along with police, fire crew, and council's structural engineers. The mine shaft known as Cox Lodge Colliery a Jubilee shaft was operating uh, or operational during the 1820s and it's nearly about 200 years old. So the mine was recorded as being closed in 1891 but the Coal Authority's investigations showed that the shaft was left open at this time to help ventilate other mine shafts in the working area. And so they of course had to make this right um, so they needed to put in the works to cap the mine shaft and make it safe over 65 cubic meters of reinforced concrete were used to repair uh, the area in Quester Square ground investigations which included drilling boreholes to investigate the mine shaft structure and fill materials as well as conditions underground and this cost about 300,000 pounds and all of the work was eventually completed and this was back in 2016 um, and as you can see the cars are back in, in the parking lot and when you look at the the con 29m data you know showing this site you can see the site where it was and the zone of influence which is what that red circle is um, so it is really really important again to to kind of get an understanding of what we look at what we take into consideration, which minerals we're taking into account. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's so much, it's coal, it's all different types. Uh, so really it's, it's very, very important to, to know how much work goes into calculating risk and assessing risk um, when it comes to all types of mining. Now, in terms of compliance and, and support, you know, no, I think coal is a fairly common risk that everybody knows about. I think non-coal and ground stability seem to be probably the lesser known risks uh, amongst the general public awareness and, and conveyancing in general. Uh, most of the firms or all, almost all the firms will provide an environmental search to make sure that, of course, you're covering the Law Society guidance on contaminated land and flood. You obviously have the CON 29M, which is required. Um, but I think ground stability and non-coal still go fairly underreported. And whilst there isn't an official practice note, there is a whole section on mineral extraction and ground stability in the conveyancing handbook, um, which basically states that a property should be searched to identify whether further investigation of site-specific ground instability uh, risks is required. So this is where we, we can come in to help because obviously we're not just covering coal, we're covering all different types of mining. So this is where we want to make sure we're trying to help you guys stay as compliant as possible. Um, so again, depending on where you are in the country and what your requirements are, uh, 
you can either cover yourself for coal uh, as a CON29, an official CON29M. Um, you can cover yourself for non-coal, so all of the other minerals I've talked about previously uh, and the data sets and the assessments I've talked about previously to make sure that you're compliant with with a section B 25.17 of the Conveyancing Handbook. And then if you happen to be uh, also in the Cheshire Salt area, then you know we can help you with that as well because that's included in our VISTA report. So again, depending on what your requirements are, if you want to cover everything all in one go, then something like an Avista would be appropriate. If not, and you've already got an Enviro and you just want coal, then you can, you know, we've got a standalone coal uh, option as well. Or if you are not in a coal area, um, but do want um, non-coal mining or ground stability to be looked at, again, depending on what your requirements, there are standalone reports for that as well. So there are options for everybody, but I guess from, a, from an ease perspective, if you just want to cover off everything in one go, then there is a report available which covers all of the types of mining, as well as natural ground instability, um, as well as things like coastal erosion, that's all included uh, in something like the Avista as well. So hopefully that is um, that was a helpful session for you and, and we've given you kind of a brief whirlwind tour of, of the legacy that we have when it comes to different kinds of mining. Thank you for joining me today. If you've got any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. If you'd like a copy of the recording um, or a copy of the slides, let us know and we can provide that for you. And one last thing, if um, if you could, there will be a feedback survey that will pop up straight after the, the webinar, and we'd love it if you could take a few seconds to just provide us with some feedback. Thanks very much, and have a great rest of the day.